Welcome to 10 Minute Records Views, episode 201. And this time we're going to talk about the album recorded by Grant Green in 1963, released in 1965, often considered to be his best, Idle Moments. And what I have here is I think around a yeah 2013 uh, reissue, one of those Blue Note reissues. So Grant Green was the house guitarist at Blue Note Records between 1961, or 1960 even, and 1965. And in that period of time, he appears on more Blue Note Records during the classic period of the label than anybody else. But his playing as a leader is very different from his playing as a sideman. As a session guy, he bent with the wind, of course, and he played all kinds of different styles. But as a leader, he very rarely ever played chords. He always just picked single notes. And this is widely attributed to the fact that most of his musical inspiration was not actually drawn from guitarists, though he was a big fan of Charlie Christian, like so many people who grew up in the middle part of the 20th century who were guitarists. But his main inspiration was actually saxophonists, like people like Charlie Parker. In this, his playing style is very different from all the other jazz guitar greats of the 1960s, people like Barney Kessel, Tell Farlow, Jim Hall, and his tone is also quite different as well. If you think about, you know, say Jim Hall or George Benson, the way they play guitar, the way their guitar sounds, it's usually big and fat and dense with a nice bottom end and it sort of well, has a very round sound. Green is very different. What he would do is he would turn down the treble and the bass and crank up the mid-range on his guitar. So you get a very well, you're getting a sound which is much more commonly associated with the blues than it is with jazz, and that's not for everybody. It's not always to my taste, but it's very clearly Grant Green playing when you hear him play. Like too many jazz players, he died very young. He died at age 44 in 1979, but he had a bit of a posthumous vogue in the late 80s, or I guess the early 90s, and the whole sampling era took off and the whole acid jazz craze that happened. As I mentioned, this record is often said to be his best. The playing is super, and it's interesting how it all came together because the session plays out in some very unplanned ways. Grant Green was born in 1935 in St. Louis, Missouri. He was primarily self-taught in the guitar. He dropped out of school around age 14, and around this time then began to play in all kinds of R&B and jazz combos around St. Louis. In 1959, the saxophonist Lou Donaldson, later of Alligator Boogaloo fame, discovers him in a bar playing in St. Louis and persuades him, first of all, to tour with him, but also to move to New York. And sometime around 1960, it's not exactly clear when, Green moves to New York. Donaldson then brings him along to Blue Note Records and introduces him to Alfred Lyon, who of course is the co-owner of the label, along with Francis Wolfe. And Lyon gives him an audition, absolutely loves what he hears. Now normally he would have just signed him up for some session work, but he actually gets him into the studio as a leader pretty sharpish, although those recordings weren't actually released until well after Green's death. Nevertheless, very quickly he becomes the absolute go-to in-house guitarist for Blue Note. He also releases three albums as a leader in 1961 alone. Grant's First Stand, Green Street, and Grant Stand. He's named the best new artist in the Downbeat Critics Poll in 1962, and in this period he's basically playing with everybody on the Blue Note roster, and of course that is essentially a greatest hits list of great hard bop players in the early 1960s. But he's not making a ton of money, despite the prolific appearances that he has on the label. So by 1965, he decides he's got to leave Blue Note, and he starts to head out and records for some other labels. But what happens then is the drugs take hold, and he'd been battling a drug addiction. Heroin, of course, was the drug of choice for so many jazz players in the early 60s. And it really began to get a grip on him, and it started to affect his playing. He began to get very weird and stingy about money because he always needed to score, and so he got a reputation for not playing his sidemen. Things begin to spiral downwards. By 1969, he reemerges from this terrible period. He's cleaned up, and he's also reinvented himself, and he's much more interested in playing funky tunes, in playing crossover pop. He ends up doing a lot of work with CTI in the 1970s. Has a bit of a revival, although that work is generally sneered at by, you know, top jazz folks, but I personally love it. But he never really got on top of the drugs, and his health began to fail, and then by 1978-79, he was really uh, at the end, and he dies in 1979 of a heart attack. This record is made in November 1963, on the 4th and 15th of that month, at Rudy Van Gelder's studio in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, and of course Alfred Lyon is producing, as was so common for all the Blue Note releases at that time. This, maybe more than any other record I'm aware of, is the absolute Blue Note session mafia on this record. There are six players on here, none of them has fewer than 25 separate appearances as either a leader or a sideman on Blue Note. 
creative courses on guitar. On tenor sax is Joe Henderson, a wonderful player, very versatile player and, and kind of unsung. He, of course, had played on Green's previous record, Am I Blue? On vibraphone is my favorite vibist, Bobby Hutchison. I say favorite vibist, I'm always kind of undecided about the vibes. And they don't really sound that modern to me somehow. And maybe I just listened to too much Lionel Hampton. But a lot of vibe playing, like Milt Jackson and so on, I just find is a bit of a stretch for me. But Hutcherson is the exception. I think his playing is fantastic. It all sounds very contemporary or contemporary to this era. Anyway, he's on here. On piano is Duke Pearson. And Pearson is a really interesting figure and a key figure in the whole Blue Note story in the 1960s. He's a great piano player. He gets brought into one of those great sort of hothouse groups around this time, the Farmer Golson Jazz Tet in 1960, replacing McCoy Tyner, who had come in for a while, but had just left to join John Coltrane. But the big development in Pearson's career is really when Donald Byrd reaches out and says, come and join me and Pepper Adams in the work that we're doing. And that association lasts for many, many years and produces all kinds of great work. In that work, and also his other work in general with Blue Note, he's increasingly getting into the writing, arranging, producing, and generally the business side of things, as well as just playing. He's heavily involved in the recording choices and the whole sound of Blue Note records all the way through the remainder of the 1960s. He stays until a change of regime at Blue Note in the early 1970s, when they go off in a different direction, not arguably as successful, but maybe their time had come and gone. Pearson, unfortunately, is diagnosed with MS in the mid-1970s, and he ends up dying in 1980, aged just 47. On bass is Bob Cranshaw, and if anybody can give Green a run for his money in terms of being a session guy, it's Cranshaw, who I think wins by a country mile. He appears on something like 162 jazz records as a bass player, 30 or more during the golden age of Blue Note. No albums as a leader, of course, all as a sideman, and his discography also includes 24 separate records with Sonny Rollins. On drums is Al Harewood, like Grant Green, an absolute regular at Blue Note between 1961 and 1965, I think some 20 Blue Note records around that time, and he had previously played on Green's record, Grandstand. So this is a Green record, but it's also this kind of Blue Note collective record, and it's also a record that Duke Pearson has his fingers all over, because he has written two of these tracks, and his playing is excellent, particularly in side two, where it just swings so hard. The first track, the title track, Idle Moments, is actually written by Pearson, and there's an interesting story behind this. It's easily one of the most epically languid jazz tracks you'll ever hear. And the story was that they had not really figured out how long people were going to solo. And recall, there's six players here, and there are three people taking solos typically on these tracks. And the soloist, instead of soloing for 32 bars, soloed for 64, and they end up with a track that is whatever it is, 13 or 14 minutes, I forget exactly how long it is. But it's so long that they then had to go back and redo some of their other tracks that they've been happy with because they love this very long version. When it came in at 13 plus minutes, Lyon said, oh, I guess we've got to redo it because it's not going to fit. They tried and tried, but they couldn't recapture that feel. And eventually they put the first take in the record and we can all be grateful that they did because this is an absolutely lovely tune. And I would say you need a really good whiskey to work your way all the way through this. Green is great, of course, but I really key on this wonderful performance by Henderson who gives the most breathy, airy kind of tenor sax performance that you'll hear maybe from any of the great tenor players in the 1960s. Jean de Fleur, which is the second track, is by Grant Green. Total change of pace, much more up-tempo, kind of like the soundtrack to a scene from a movie set in Times Square, that kind of feel. Side 2 begins with the cover of John Lewis's Django, and this originally had been in a much longer track too, and they actually did do a shorter version of it in order to be able to fit. This and the next track on side two are easily the hardest swinging tracks in the whole record, and Pearson's feel in the piano is all over those. The final track, Nomad, is an up-tempo number which also swings really hard. Notable for a variety of reasons, but again, the one that sticks in my mind is the way that Henderson quotes Coltrane, I think, at one point in his solo. Kind of cheeky, but anyway, he had the skill to pull that off and just sneak it in there. With just four tracks, of which two are very long, it may come as a surprise that I'm saying that one of the real selling points of this record is the variety. But recall that these are all completely seasoned session players, and they slide easily from style to style, and variety is what you get. Green's tone, I would say, is more of a blues tone than a jazz tone, and in this context, it's never really been my taste, but that's more common to my own preference than it is on his art, which I think is well established as being admired by many, many people. You have six players here offering this great combination of spontaneity and togetherness. For me, it's a pretty slick record, and it's four and a half out of five stars.